Times 18 economists over the weekend found that 89 percent said it's a terrible idea for Trump to curb immigration to the United States. Experts overwhelmingly predicted it would slow growth, the exact opposite of what Trump wants to do with Maganomics. Restricting immigration will only condemn us to chronically low rates of economic growth, said Bernard Bamoul, chief global economist at the Economic Outlook Group. It also increases the risk of recession. Thomas Simons, senior economist at the Jefferies investment firm, called the idea absolutely harmful to an economy with a population undergoing the demographic transformation. The bottom line is the United States needs more workers. Growth happens when one of two things occurs. The economy gets more workers or the existing workers become more productive. At the moment, both of those factors are red flags. Productivity growth is sluggish, and as Trump has pointed out many times, the percent of American adults who actually work, the labor force participation rate, is hovering at the lowest levels since the 1970s. A big part of the problem is the baby boomers are starting to retire. The United States needs more people to replace them. But the U.S. birth rate just hit a historic low according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That's why many economists, demographers, and business owners keep calling for more immigration, not less. Limiting immigration to the U.S. is a grave mistake, says Mark Zandi, chief economist at Moody's Analytics. The only way to meaningfully increase U.S. economic growth on a sustained basis anytime soon is to increase immigration. During the campaign, Zandi predicted that Trump's protectionist stances on trade and immigration would lead to a lengthy recession. According to Zandi's economic models, Trump's worst policy was his plan to deport 11 million immigrants currently in the country illegally. Now scaling back on legal immigration is a serious part of the policy discussion. Congress and the White House are dealing with a slew of issues. Immigration appeared to be sidelined until a much-cited political report last week that top Trump aides are actively working with Senators Tom Cotton and David Perdue, both Republicans, by the way, to cut legal immigration by as much as 50 percent. It would be a revised version of the RAISE Act that the senators introduced in February and that would cut back on the number of refugees allowed in each year and make it much harder for anyone other than spouses or minor children of U.S. citizens or permanent residents to immigrate. Trump still sees action on immigration as a critical part of his agenda. He brought it up on his trip to France last week. What I'd like to do is a comprehensive immigration plan, the president told reporters on his way to Paris. But our country and political forces are not ready yet. We'll never be ready for your plan, bud. Anyway, <clears throat> to continue, if Trump can't get the bigger immigration overhaul he wants, he's likely to push for something like the Rays Act. Trump says the United States needs to limit immigration, legal and illegal, to give workers at home a better chance. One of the proposals Cotton and Purdue are considering is slashing the number of legally issued green cards from one million a year to 500,000 over the next decade. Trump, 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 dump, Trump? Trump portrays immigrants as scooping up American jobs, but the data appears to tell a different story. U.S. unemployment is at 4.4 percent. In May, unemployment hit the lowest level since 2001, a milestone Trump celebrated. That implies there aren't many people struggling to find work. At the same time, the United States has 5.7 million job openings, which is near a record high. It's been that way for a year now. Business leaders with big and small firms say they can't find enough workers. They are especially vocal about not being able to find enough people for really low-skilled, low-pay work and for really highly skilled jobs. Take Bayard Winthrop. No, you take Bayard Winthrop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. That's silly. Anyway, uh, Take Bayard Winthrop. He is founder and chief executive of American Giant, a company that Slate said produces the greatest hoodie ever made. Hmm. American Giant makes those masterpiece sweatshirts by using only U.S. workers, U.S. cotton, 
and U.S. manufacturing. In other words, Winthrop is the living embodiment of the Made in America, a movement Trump is trying to resurrect. Yet, one of the biggest problems Winthrop faces is not enough American workers want to do the hard work of picking cotton. If you go through our supply chain and talk to a lot of the businesses that are ginning cotton, dyeing, and finishing cotton, what you hear pretty universally is that they have open job requests, but few people actually want these entry-level, lower-wage jobs, he says Monday in an interview with WAMU Radio. His message, message to Trump is, make immigration much more accessible. Trump is already heeding the calls for more low-skilled workers. His administration just bumped up visas for seasonal foreign workers by 15,000, a 45% increase from last year. There's little love among economists and business leaders for a 50% cut in immigration overall, but there is growing support for moving the United States to a more merit-based immigration system. The idea is to attract more of the immigrant workers that the country desperately needs. At the moment, only 15% of green cards are issued for employment reasons, according to the Department of Homeland Security data. There is a case for adopting a Canada-style system of points, whereby preference is given to people with desired skills, said Martin Barnes, chief economist at BCA Research in Montreal. The vast majority of legal immigrants are entering the country because they are relatives of somebody already in the United States. It's known as chain immigration, and the Rays Act wants to limit that substantially so only spouses and children could come with a visa holder, not more extended relatives. From an economic standpoint, the key is to get more workers with the desired skills into the country. It is why the tech community is lobbying so hard for more H-1B visas. Immigrants also tend to start more businesses. While startup founders in Silicon Valley are glorified, the reality is business formation in the United States is near a 40-year low. That worries Carl Tannenbaum, chief economist at Northern Trust. Countries that get collectively older are granted fewer patents, start fewer small businesses, and take fewer risks with capital, Tannenbaum said. All of that hurts economic growth. Tannenbaum is concerned not only that Trump will cut immigration in the future, but also that the president's anti-immigrant rhetoric and controversial travel ban are already encouraging the best young minds in the world to look elsewhere for their college educations and early careers. If smart kids get educated elsewhere, the U.S. will experience a talent drain that we will certainly come to regret, Tannenbaum warned. Yeah. So that's uh, kind of, you know, cooking in the background, as they say. And, and as I pointed out earlier, <clears throat> I don't think this is Trump's baby. I think he has a general anti-immigrant attitude that can be played upon by people with very more specific and very uh, ideo ideological anti-immigrant beliefs. Um, so Bannon and uh, some of these other people who will, you know, tease out that kind of thing from Trump. But I think Trump basically is just, I want to make a lot of money. I want to have a lot of power. I want everybody to, to respect and fear me. And I'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. I really feel that um, he, he has very little what, personal beliefs. I don't know. Well, here's an interesting thing. I read this earlier. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, da -de -da -de -da. Well, uh, okay. Um, it is. Yeah, this is not exactly about immigration, but it it's, it's, was an interesting take here. Uh, this is entitled, A Chronicle of Predation, Appetites, and Power. It was by Josh Marshall. And he begins, Our reading for today comes from Seinfeld, episode number 29. George says, 
Was that wrong? Should I not have done that? I tell you, I got to plead ignorance on this thing, because if anyone had said anything to me at all when I first started here, that that sort of thing was frowned upon, you know, because I've worked in a lot of offices, and I tell you, people do that all the time. Some of you will recognize this passage from a classic episode of Seinfeld, which now seems hilariously and painfully familiar. We've now heard from the president's son, the president's top media toadies, and now even the president himself, a simple message. Yes, we'd work with a hostile foreign intelligence service to get dirt on and defeat a political enemy. Anyone would. That's politics, as the president put it this morning. In other words, we've now gone rapidly from no collusion, no obstruction, to collusion is awesome. To a great degree, this is no more complicated than people who are willing to justify anything and say anything and continue shifting the goalposts as the facts evolve. But there's a deeper issue that even this, which became clear over the course of the 2016 campaign, and which I would argue is in its own way as important and dangerous as what now seems to be the clear evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and emissaries of the Russian government. Here's how I would put it. Is Donald Trump a conservative? He certainly seems like one now. There's also a number of consistent themes in his biography going back decades that provide continuity with today. Hostility to immigrants and minorities, strong support of protectionism and affinity for foreign dictators. This all amounts to a sort of revanchist populism, which matches up with the key elements of contemporary conservatism, even as it deviates from others. So that's Donald Trump, except when it's not. Certainly he's not a conservative in any real sense, even though he's entirely adopted the rhetoric and policy agenda of deregulation, tax cuts, and all the rest. What about Don Jr.? He's now the Trump family member most beloved by the so-called alt-right, i.e. internet-focused racists and the far right. Is Donald Trump Jr. really a political person at all? In other words, was he a political person before his father adopted birtherism as his political movement half a dozen years ago? I see no evidence for that. Jared Kushner and certainly his family were actually high-powered Democratic donors in New Jersey, at least before Charles Kushner went to prison. My point here is not that these people are not really conservatives and thus maybe something else. It's that they're not really anything. I certainly think the far-right politics comes naturally to the president in many ways. My guess is that the same is true for his son, Don Jr. But fundamentally, politics itself and everything most of us think as policy is alien to all of these people, except as an opportunity. Politics, for them, is about winning, power, and self-enrichment. Of course, the first two of these, winning and power, play some role for the great majority of politicians. And self-enrichment, albeit often in technically legal permutations, is a preoccupation with many politicians. With the Trumps, I believe that is really all there is, power and appetite. That's it. If you look through Trump's business history, you see a similar pattern. He goes lux or bargain basement, clean or crooked. It's whatever counts as a win in the context. Having researched the Trumps a lot, they started to look more and more to me like a mob family in the sense that whether things were legal or right just didn't seem to be a metric they operated in. Lots of people break laws. That doesn't make them unique. But this is a bit different. Looking over Trump's history, breaking laws or not or cheating people or not just never seem to have been part of the equation. Which brings us to Trump Jr. in the June 2016 meeting at Trump Tower. I do not think we know even close to the full story about this yet, either this meeting or the broader collaboration between the Trump campaign and Russia during the 2016 election. But in most respects, Don Jr.'s reaction to an explicit offer of assistance from the Russian government did not surprise me. At some level, the man was a fool to openly and gleefully welcome Russian government assistance by email. That is insane. Some have expanded on this incredulity to think somehow that Trump was new at this. New at politics? New at running for president? New at being an American? This is, of course, nonsensical. Don Jr. is about to turn 40. He has a large family. He's been an executive in a large international business for most of his adult life. 
Despite what Trump's media toadies are saying today, almost anybody without a severe mental disability would be able to understand intuitively that it is not okay to work with a foreign government with a history of hostility to the U.S. in a U.S. election campaign. But there's one small element of truth to the was that wrong argument. Everything we know about the Trumps suggests they are fundamentally amoral people. Their loyalty is to a tri triad of enrichment, power, and family. The order in that hierarchy I don't really know. The idea that there are limits to what you do in pursuit of those goals is, I believe, quite alien to them. And so again, back to Don Jr. Does this 39-year-old man have some affinity for Russia? Does he espouse some ideology that made this breach seem okay to him? I very much doubt it. It's much simpler. His father, and in a broader sense his family, was running for president, which meant power and money. The idea that there were any lines that were uncrossable in pursuit of that aim is, again, quite alien. I confess that with all I've read and seen over the last two years, even I was astonished at the total alacrity and glee with which Don Jr. embraced the offer. But as soon as I did, I realized that I shouldn't be. It is who these people are. I've written as much. I just hadn't followed it out to its logical conclusion, even though I thought I had. It's the thread uniting the self-dealing nonprofits, the endless lying about charitable giving, Trump University, swindling the people he fleeced when he took his dying casino business public. It's also what explains the long history of involvement in money laundering. To put this all as clearly as I can, it's not that somehow Don Jr. was so profoundly clueless that he didn't know this was a problem. He knew enough to lie about it for at least a year. It's not that he doesn't know it's wrong or against the law. It is that in this family, having that be a break or obstacle to action is simply alien. Dad's good. Hillary's bad. What's the problem? Of course he loves it. It fits the family's entire pattern. The additional factor to the Trumps is the coterie of lackeys and toadies who trail around them. There are numerous people in the Trump universe who were either apolitical or relatively committed Democrats before 2016, and now they're the most committed Trumpers. Other people who probably had not entirely embraced a total amorality are nonetheless dragged along. We call them dignity wraiths. But another way to look at it is that there is a contagious amorality that emanates from the Trumps. Needless to say, people who know no limits to their actions, not even cynical limits on actions that may simply be too dangerous to risk, what keeps many, though by no means all super powerful people in check, are very, very dangerous people, and all the more so when they take control of a state with such vast powers. So that's, you know, off topic, topic a bit, but that gets at what I've, I've sort of been pointing at in some of these articles and, and trying to say here is that I really don't think, yeah, Trump is anti-immigrant or anti-minority or however you want to look at it. He's got negative feelings about that, but that's not what motivates him. What motivates him is power, money, control, respect fear. He wants those things from people. He wants to instill those things in people, inspire those things in people. Um, that's what motivates him. So if <clears throat> immigration doesn't seem like a big deal to him, he just ignores it and moves on to something else. <clears throat> but I think there are, excuse me, <clears throat> I of course didn't bring anything to drink and of course need something. Anyway, um, I think that there are people around him uh, involved in his universe or who are in the government and have some power of their own who very much have distinctive ideologies and who are always working on and pushing towards achieving some kind of ideological goal of remaking the, the U.S. in their image. Trump is not trying to make anything in his image. He's trying to make something. He's, he's on the make, as they say. He's trying to um, get as much as he can and feel as powerful as he can. If he could, you know, 
had a button that he could push to blow things up, he'd be doing that all the time, you know, if he thought he could get away with it, because that's the kind of person he is. As I see him, that's how I understand him to be uh, from observing him. So I think it will be the interesting thing about immigration here in the next, oh gosh, <laughs> three years, three and a half years. <clears throat> Shorter if if uh, he gets impeached, maybe, but that probably won't happen. But anyway, over the ne the rest of his term will be to see how different people push and pull him as he charges ahead in his search for power and glory. Um, you know how they can use that because you know when you've got somebody who has had such naked ambition, such obvious desire you i want to be respected i must have respect i must have power you must fear me and 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 you know kind of bow down to me and stuff <clears throat> no one is more easy to play than somebody who has that kind of like enormous weakness because <clears throat> let's face it, you know, anybody with any real power is content to just sit back and be powerful. The people who are exercising power um, are either doing so because they have a goal, a reason, or they're doing so because it's the thing that makes them feel powerful. It is the exercise of power that gives them the feeling of power. And it's it's almost like a bottomless pit. You can never have enough because no matter how much you do it, you don't feel it inside as much. You know, it's like uh, performers going out on stage, love me, love me, love me, and everybody's loving them, but they're not feeling it. They want to be feeling it. Or they feel it for that brief moment while they're on stage and then they get off and they have to take drugs and, and drink alcohol and do all these things in order to like kind of uh, you know, kill the pain till the next time they can get on stage. Um, there, people like that, people who have this like gaping need inside of them, are are pretty easy to manipulate. And I fear that um, there are enough people that are learning that or will learn that about uh, this Trump person that um, it's going to be very strange. <laughs> um, term here, term, I, I don't even know what to call it, the next few years. I I'd, I'd choke when I try to say that. I can't even say it. Um, yeah, the rest of the term is going to be uh, fraught, to put it mildly. Um, <clears throat> but hey, you know, you get what you vote for, and that's what we voted for, or that's what enough people voted for that we got it, and... Um, I just hope that they will learn their lesson <clears throat> and never do it again. Anyway, we're approaching the end. We're not there yet, but I just should remind you that you're listening to CU Immigration here on WRFULP, Urbana, 104.5 FM. And uh, we're talking about immigration, and when we're talking about immigration, we're talking about politics in this country because the two are so intertwined that they don't even exist without each other, basically. And, um, well, politics could exist without immigration, but immigration as an issue does not exist without politics. It's an entirely political issue. So I have just a few minutes left. I'm trying to think of what I want to read here. We have foreign-born recruits promised citizenship by the Pentagon flee the country to avoid deportation. Very sad. Uh, how about... ACLU accuses Madera County of violating open meeting law and changing immigration policy behind closed doors. Oh, that sounds right. All right, so the American Civil Liberties Union sued the Madera County Board of Supervisors on Monday, alleging that it violated California's open meetings law when it changed an immigration-related policy behind closed doors. In March, the supervisors increased cooperation between the county's jail and U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Sounds like uh, secure communities to me. Yep. 
In March? Oh, yeah. Uh, 30, press release, Madera County District Attorney David Lynn announced that the board had unanimously instructed the director of the county's Department of Corrections to fully comply with all ICE requests. Under the new policy, jail leaders must notify ICE when immigrant inmates are being released and schedule times for ICE agents to pick them up. Lynn told Valley Public Radio in April that ICE is, inter is interested in any immigrant who has committed a felony. As of today, we are definitely not a sanctuary county in that we are in compliance with ICE requests, Lynn said in a release. He said failing to cooperate with immigration authorities could result in the loss of $46 million in federal funds. He added that he believes the cooperation with ICE will prevent the agency from having to conduct raids in residential areas, schools, and on farms. Minutes for the March 7 meeting state that the board met in closed session to discuss a public employee performance evaluation for the corrections director and that no action was taken. Hmm, really? The ACLU alleges that the immigration policy was changed during that session based on its review of public records, news accounts, and Lynn's press release. The Ralph M. Brown Act guarantees the public's right to attend and participate in meetings of local legislative bodies. The ACLU lawsuit says the board's decision required the opportunity for public comment. A public agency such as the Madeira County Board of Supervisors simply cannot change a major policy behind closed doors, said Julia Harumi Mas, a senior attorney, attorney, <laughs> an eternity. <clears throat> Let me try that again. A senior attorney with the ACLU of Northern California. Lynn, the district attorney, said in a March 1 letter to the board that ICE had contacted his office numerous times, saying the jail had refused to cooperate with them as required by law and was releasing dangerous felons into the local community. What? Wait a minute. 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 Okay. <laughs> The jail does not release dangerous felons into the community. The jail releases people who have finished serving their time and are set to be released. That is completely inaccurate and, and misleading and downright propaganda. That is not correct. Huh. Okay. Anyway, sorry. That just annoys me. They're not releasing dangerous felons into the local community. If the dangerous felons have served their time, they are being released, as is the custom with all jails everywhere. That's how they do it. You go in, you're here for this period of time. At the end of the time, you are released. Maybe you are a dangerous felon, but you have served your time. That's how the law works. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Anyway, he said he had extended discussions with numerous community members to obtain their views concerning ICE deportations. Sure. <coughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I ran out of time while I was ranting. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. I'm done. I got I to gotta finish up here. Uh, we've got two minutes left, and I uh, can't keep reading. So, um, yeah, there you have it. Just another thing that made me mad and I was complaining about. It. Uh, but you have li been listening to CU Immigration here on WRFU LP, Urbana, 104.5 FM. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you will tune in uh, next week at around the same time. And until then, have a great week.